Welcome to our Ask the Expert series. I am delighted to be here today with Dr. Abe Mogakar, a neurologist, and Dr. Mark Luciano, a neurosurgeon with the Johns Hopkins Cerebrofluid Center for CSF Disorders. And I'm also here with my coworker, Jennifer Bouchard, Education Manager at the Hydrocephalus Association. I want to talk today about intracranial pressure. So is there a normal uh, pre like setting, or uh, not setting, but a normal um, right. range for intracranial pressure? There is a normal range for intracranial pressure, and it's defined uh, in a certain body position. You have to be on your side, your legs have to be straight, you have to be relaxed, your head has to be in a neutral position, and then when you measure the pressure by a lumbar puncture, the range is wide. It's between 5 to 25 centimeters of water in an adult and 5 to 28 centimeters of water in a child. And again, this range is defined only in a certain body position. We, kn we know that pressure changes with your daily activities. It's not the same in the day and night. And to capture those changes in pressure, we often have to resort to intracranial pressure monitoring, which Dr. Luciano does often. Yeah, I agree. The, the, the lumbar puncture can give us very valuable information, really in a few minutes, of, about a person's pressure. But it's only one number, uh, and it's done in one situation, as you say. And often we're not sure if, uh, if, if it was done in the way that, that we might say is ideal. So sometimes we're a little uncertain even of that one number. Intracranial pressure monitoring means measuring pressure from the head, the cranium itself. It does require uh, a sedation or even anesthesia uh, to implant a probe, usually in the right frontal region, uh, it takes really about 10 minutes, but it is a probe that goes through the skull through a two millimeter hole, and it's a wire probe that goes in and measures the pressure inside the skull. It's secured there. So it's an operative procedure. However, uh, after that relatively quick procedure, the person has almost like an IV line coming out, and we uh, observe them and monitor the pressure for a period of time. And that period of time is usually at least 48 hours, but it can even be considerably longer. Why do we do this? Well, for one thing, again, the pressure is measured right up here where it counts. Uh, and so it eliminates some of artifactual issues. But more importantly, it's more than just one number. We can see the pulsations to see, get an idea of the, com the compliance and the flexibility of the brain. But also we can do it, uh, do the measurements while the patient's asleep. Dr. Mogukar mentioned that uh, sleep and, and, and uh, being awake, you, there, there may be different kinds of pressure during the day. At night, there may be waves of pressure, for example, which become diagnostic of a pressure abnormality. So we can sometimes detect some high pressures that wouldn't be seen in the LP uh, during the day. Another important aspect of measuring the ICP is to detect low pressures. Now, I think you mentioned the lower limit of about five uh, for some pressure. Uh, sometimes that, that could be, you can get a pressure of six or seven, but when the patient sits up or the patient stands up, and we have our patients with intracranial pressure monitoring, uh, do all those things. We have them lay flat and come up gradually. We have them sit up, stand up, even walk around for a morning and, and, uh, and then be remeasured. When they do that, sometimes we find pressures that are abnormally low. That's something like minus 12, minus 13. I should mention that all of our pressures as we sit here are negative, slightly negative. So neg negative pressures when a person is standing up is actually normal. But we can look at abnormally low pressures, and that can help us decide if a person is uh, having what's called intracranial hypotension, which can cause headaches and many other neurological problems. It could be something that's spontaneous due to a leak, or in the case of chronic hydrocephalus, sometimes it's a shunt, which is working, actually working too well and draining too much. So we can observe problems with intracranial pressure that are harder to detect just with a single lumbar puncture, both high and low, uh, by using this technique. And, we found that many times, I would say the majority of times, what we find uh, in these patients we're not sure have pressure abnormalities, that maybe the pressure is just normal and no more shunting should be done and no other processes should be done. So we find that with intracranial pressure monitoring, uh, sometimes it stops us from doing things that we don't need to do, which is as valuable. So let's, let's bring it to the patients. So a, a patient, it seems like this is a, a tool to help provide information around treatment and whether the shunt is optimally working and managing um, an individual's hydrocephalus. So 
I am curious now from the patient perspective, as I'm sure all of you are, is what leads somebody to end up needing to get uh, pressure monitoring? So, Jen, I'm, I'm sure that there have been many instances where you have ended up in the hospital and they've wanted to monitor your pressures. Can you give some examples of what led you to the hospital to have your pressure monitored? Yeah, my ventricles don't change in size. And so typically what we'll do if I'm very symptomatic, if I, I feel like I'm overdraining, We'll do a pressure monitor to actually confirm that I'm overdraining, watch those numbers. Um, and then if I feel like my pressure's too high, they'll do it as well to kind of watch those numbers and just confirm before actually going in and changing the valve or doing anything like that. So some of the symptoms you're experiencing are headache. Headaches, um, for me, nausea and vomiting, um, blurred vision. For everybody, it's different though. Yeah, and I think it is important to note that everybody is different in how they respond to pressure changes. Um, and so a, a patient comes in, she's experiencing um, incredible headaches, uh, maybe a scan is not completely conclusive to say that something's going on. Is this the situation where you would then want to check uh, pressures? Uh, generally speaking, uh, you know, we shouldn't do a procedure like implanting a, a probe unless other more standard ways of saying is the shunt working, is it not working, is shunt patency studies perhaps and taps, and of course imaging. But we do know, as in, as in your case and in many people's case, the ventricles are often not a good indicator of how much uh, pressure abnormality there may be. When that doesn't give us information uh, and when, for example, there may be a shunt patency study which shows some flow, we really don't have an idea of the true uh, function of the system unless we do a, a pressure type measurement. So when all those other things don't give us enough information, if they find like you know, your shunt is working, if you find a ventricles that are bigger and the shunt's blocked, you don't need to do pressure monitoring. But in these other cases, it's helpful. Great, and Dr. Mogukar, did you have anything you wanted to add? So we always rely on less invasive studies first, and that involves the lumbar puncture. In some patients, the eye exam can be very critical if you see signs of intracranial pressure that's elevated, causing elevated optic discs, that's a sign. Uh, but all these I would consider are trailers, and the movie, which is the gold standard, remains ICP monitoring. And just to repeat to close our session, again, those normal ranges for intracranial pressure are five to 25 in an adult and five to 28 in a child and the units are centimeters of water. Great. Well, thank you all for joining us for today's segment and I'd like to thank all of you for joining us as well and for those of you that submitted, submitted questions through Facebook and Twitter, thank you for being a part of our Ask the Experts series and we'll see you next time.